And now it's Deborah Cobalt Live. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today on Deborah Cobalt Live. And look who's joining me, Valerie Condos Field. Thanks for being here, Valerie. You're just quite an inspiration to so many of us. Uh, hardly need an introdu introduction, but in case for those who don't know, you were named the Pac-12 Coach of the Century, not the year, the decade, the century. And I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, um, what comes after that once you receive that? But there's a whole lot more. Um, you are so well known for being the uh, head coach, right, for 29 years of the UCLA women's gymnastics team. You're here to talk about that, your life and your book, Life is Short, Don't Wait to Dance, Advice and Inspiration from the UCLA Athletics Hall of Fame coach of seven NCAA championship teams. Thank you so much for being here, Valerie. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. This is fun. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. And your book is in fantastic, you know, because we spoke, we've met, we spoke off the, off the air. And I love some of the little buzzwords. I'm one of those people, I will take um, a word out of a book or out of a conversation. And one word that really stuck with me is discipline. Uh, that's hard for so many, but I think once you get on that and you just uh, use that word discipline, it starts to grow. So what I'd like to do is take it back to who you were as a kid and the discipline that you had as a ballet dancer, because that's really what you were. You weren't a gymnast, which is incredible. Talk to me. Let's go back. Hi. Right. Oh, that's <clears throat> it's interesting. Yeah. You haven't told me about that word yet, so that's great. Yeah. Um, yes, I grew up in the world of ballet, and <clears throat> I was also a piano pianist and uh now that you're saying it, it's all flooding back to me um what you learn in disciplines like that which is one reason why i love sport but what you learn in in sport in any type of um performance art is the discipline of the basics mm. and how every day you start off with that discipline. And as a kid, I don't know about other people, but I hated it. I hated playing my piano scales. I hated taking ballet class. I wasn't, oh. I wasn't a stereotypical, like I literally would stand there and I would have directors or ballet teachers tell me your head is too big and your neck is too short and your arms are too short. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, there's nothing I can do about this people, but I could dance. And so I didn't want to take mm the basics. I didn't want to have the discipline to put intention behind the, the ballet bar, which is your warm up. I want to just go on stage and dance. And mm -hmm. um, later on, when I became a gymnastics coach, as you said, I've never done gymnastics in my entire life. Uh, but I had those philosophies of how to achieve greatness and excellence at a high level. And that was always making sure to go back and honor your basics and having that discipline. And this is the key, Deborah. It's not about being motivated. Mm. So many people, I feel they wait to get motivated, to get healthy, to end a relationship, to whatever. It's not about that. It's about the discipline and the steps and, and having the courage to take those steps to achieve whatever goal you want. Forget waiting to be motivated. Yeah. You know, I love that you also talk about your mom and dad and how you were an incredible dancer as a young person. Of course, we know that. And they gave you a great gift. They said to you, Valerie, you don't have to go to college. Take your shot now and go be a dancer. Um, and then, of course, we're leading up to you going to UCLA. So um, that was quite a gift from them. Right. Let's talk about that and how the heck you ended up at UCLA um, as a gymnastics coach. Well, you know, this is a great discussion to have, especially with parents. Um, and yeah. I love sharing that story because my father was an artist and he was first generation Greek. I know you're Italian. That was like our first connection. But, um, you know, Im as immigrants come over, you, you don't want your son saying, I'm going to go be an artist. I didn't, they didn't leave Greece to come over to have you flounder as an artist. But when my dad said he was wanted to go to art school, his father said, great, go live your dream. And mm. 
So I grew up in a house that was in a family that was very academic minded. Um, you, you go to high school and you go to college. That was it. And that's why my grandparents came from Greece. So we all could live that American dream. And part of that American dream is to go to college. And when I graduated high school and I was dancing professionally and trying to go to college, like I say in the book, one of the greatest gifts my my father gave me was he sat me down, told me the story of his father and just said, honey, do you love to dance? And I said, I love to dance. And he said, then go do that as long as you can, because you can always go back to school. And so it wasn't just advice, but he, and this is what I like to share with parents. He released me from any guilt that I would have felt not following the steps that I'm supposed to as a good daughter. And so the supposed to, I think, is what parents get tied into so much. My Mm -hmm. my child has to get the good grades because they have to go to an Ivy League or they have to get a D1 scholarship. No, they don't. Not to live a successful life. No, they don't. Yeah, they have to follow but their hearts. I was just about to say, you pulled it right out of my mouth. You just have to follow what's right in here. You literally pulled that out of my mouth, Valerie, honestly. Um, so then you were on your way to being a professional dancer and you got a phone call. Talk to me about that. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh huh. And, and I, the fun part about me dancing professionally was, as I said, my head was too big. My neck was too short. I didn't have to turn out. I was not flexible, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. But I just kept showing up and I kept getting yeah. parts because I love to dance. And, um, you know, sorry, but I'm jumping ahead. But like my mentor, John Wooden, when you look at his pyramid of success, the cornerstones are industriousness and enthusiasm. Work your ass off and have a great attitude. And when you bring those two things, which I brought every day to, to training and to, to the discipline of the training, I found yeah. a way to be enthusiastic about it. It's just mm. the doors open up. But um, I was dancing uh, back East and I heard, I was 22 years old and I heard that UCLA needed a dance coach for their gymnastics team. Right. And my dream truly was, I missed, I missed school. I missed learning. Yeah. And without any hesitation, I found out who the head coach, called him up, gave him my credentials. And I'll never forget when he said, I don't have a salary for you, but I can give you a full scholarship if you've not mm. gone to school. I was like, done and done. So that was 1982. I retired from dancing, moved to Los Angeles, started working at UCLA as their choreographer. Um, My entire adult career up until that, I was at UCLA for 37 years. Mm -hmm. None of that would have happened had I been too afraid to pick up that phone and make the ask. Right. so many of us are worried about other people's opinions about us. We're afraid to make, to pick up that, just make the ask. And I remember my mom saying, you just, you just asked. I said, mom, the worst thing he could say is no. And why would I take that personally? He doesn't even know me. It's fine. I made the ask. Yeah. That's gutsy though, right? You were like, it was back in the day, long before the computer and, you know, cell phones texting somebody or an email, you just pick up the phone you know, I used to have a whole thing when I wanted to get to news directors. I knew that the secretaries would go home <laughs> around five o'clock. So I would always call their lines at like 530 and six, knowing they would be there and they would pick up. And then, of course, I was frozen thinking, what do I say? But you get my point, right? You have to pick up the phone somehow in today's world and just figure it out. Get to the head of the line when you want something. I love that you did that, Valerie. So you came out here and you became uh, you started working with the gymnastics team, the dream to go to UCLA. Uh, Tell me about that and that entire journey and meeting John Wooden. Well, the journey. Okay. So I I graduated with a degree in history and I was going to be a journalist and the athletic director calls me in her office and says, we're going to make a change with the head coach. And we want, we would like for you to be the new head coach. Wow. And I laughed literally out loud and said, do I need to remind you? I don't know the first thing about gymnastics. And that's crazy. gymnastics was great we finished second the year before in the country we just Mm. the head coach just couldn't get us over the top so she looks at me she was the ice queen we called her the ice queen she looked at me and she said I trust that you'll figure it out 
I was like, wow. can I have a little bit more? So no. So I said, all right, I'll throw myself into this and see what I can do. I knew, I knew nothing, which was part of my gift because mm. I didn't know. I couldn't, I couldn't pretend to know. And so mm. I had to ask a hundred questions a day, which I think a lot of leaders don't do. They assume that they know it all. So my, the, the thing that I did very, very wrong was because I knew nothing. I figured the only thing I could do was imitate other coaches. And this was 1989. This is before we started talking about mental health and wellness. Yes. This dictatorial, authoritative, badass, my way, the highway style of leadership and coaching was, it was the norm. I mean, if you're not coaching that way, you're not really a coach. So I'm like, I grew up on stage. I'll just act like a badass coach. And I did. And we were horrible. Thankfully, I had a ton of talent, but we were horrible. And my whole wow. team. So any of you that are listening, whether you're parent or oversee anybody, imagine them asking you for a sit down and for two solid hours, they're telling me, ex they're giving me specific examples of how my coaching style was hurtful and demeaning. Right, right. Your, your team, the, the girls, they, they said, we need to have a meeting. That was <laughs> gutsy of them too, because half of these people are terrified of their coach, right? Especially a coach that's a real hard ass. And, but you listened. Valerie, you took it in. Yeah, but right? that's a choice. Deborah, that's the whole point. I had yeah. a choice. And I mm. like if there's one thing that you ask any of my student athletes, what did you learn from Miss Val? Is life is about choice and the choices we make will dictate the life we live. And mm. I remember being in that moment listening to them, and a part of my brain was going, I don't care. It's my team. You don't like it. There's the door. And the other side of my brain is going, Are you trying to make them feel less than? No, mm. you have a choice. So I said, I hear you. I got it. I'm going to go back mm. and rework this. And I went back to my office and that is when I hadn't met coach Wooden yet, but that is when mm. I, I found his book on um, leadership and oh, my computer is actually sitting on it. Um, and I looked at his definition of success and here's, here's a coach. Okay. Coaches, we're hired to win. We're not mm, hired yeah. to be warm, fuzzy mentors. Coach's definition of success, he's won 10 national championships in 12 years. I read his definition of success, and it says success is peace of mind and knowing you become the best that you're capable of becoming. And I'm like, okay, let's keep reading because success is about winning. It's not this right. peace of mind nonsense. It's about winning. And I read it over and over. Success is peace of mind in knowing that you have become the best that you were capable of becoming. By trying to mimic other coaches, I had been trying to be like them. And I remember mm -hmm. having this aha moment and going, and like it, all the dots connected in my head. And I was like, okay, whenever you try to be like somebody else, you will always be a second rate them. You'll never be, I will never be as good as those coaches as they are about being themselves. And the worst thing it does is preventing me from being a first rate me. Hmm. So let's figure this out. Why is coaching important? Why are athletics important? Why, 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 why? Because I didn't really didn't give a crap about winning. Why is sport important? Why is it a gazillion dollar industry worldwide? I mean, the answer is right there in front of all of us. Sport is a master class in life lessons we don't learn, learn in the classroom. Sport yeah. is where you learn how to fall down and get back up. Sport is where you we're learning about resilience. Sport is when you become a part of something greater than yourself. Sport is when you learn courage. You don't learn all that in math, English, or science. I'm going to teach, I'm going to help these young women that are under my care become champions in life. My classroom is going to be the gym. And because I have talent, I knew that that champion mentality would translate to the competition floor. And guess what? Oh, we started winning. 
Yeah. Then I met Coach Wooden and he became, once again, the ask. I'd married my husband, who was our defensive coordinator at football. He knew Coach Wooden. I didn't know Coach Wooden. I said, let's have Coach Wooden over for dinner. My husband, who's from the South, who grew up farming, sharecropping. Coach Wooden grew up in Martinsville, Indiana, farming. I'm like, just have him over for dinner. You guys can talk about farming all night. I don't care. And my husband says, my love, Coach Wooden has a calendar that's so full. The last thing he needs is another obligation. And I said, mm. he can say no. And so I nagged my husband for three years. I mean, for three years, for three weeks. He came home <laughs> one day, said that he invited Coach Wooden over for dinner. Coach Wooden came over. He was 80 something. So we had dinner like at 530. I figured that's when octogenarians eat. And he stayed till 1130. That's when I eat. Hang on a minute. I like to eat early. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I'm not there yet. All right. Go ahead, girl. Go ahead. And uh, yeah, they talked about farming for a good portion of the evening, but it was the start of not just, he was my mentor, but we were family. He, we were really, really family until the day he died four months before his hundredth birthday. And mm -hmm. talk about like, how did, when I think about my career and I'm like, how the heck did I get to UCLA? Okay. I pick up the phone, made the call. How did I become a head coach? I have no idea. How did I figure it out? Through dedication, through discipline, through enthusiasm. How did I get this mentor in John Wooden? Probably because I was just real and I wasn't trying to be something I wasn't. Yeah, Valerie, you figured it out. You know, mm -hmm. it took the bravery of those young women to bring you into a room and talk to you and you listened, you know, you shouldn't be fearful. That's another word throughout your book, right? Don't be fearful of what, you know, you're not sure how to figure out, right? Like you, you, you left that meeting thinking, all right, what am I going to do? And you figured it out, you know, and um, you also reached for a terrific mentor. You, you picked up his book, you, you know, you instinct, you have great instinct, Valerie, because, and that's another thing to follow one's instinct because you know where you need to go and you, you tend to reach for the right person, the right mentor, the right place to learn. And as I was reading your book, I realized, cause you're also, a, you know, an inspirational coach now for very, you know, for athletes and business people, but that's what I got from your book, the bravery that you have through everything, through your coaching through your illness um, if you want to talk about that we can even segue into your breast cancer uh, which was a shock how did you approach that uh i june 9th 2014 i get the call from my doctor and i'm sure maybe a lot of your listeners have received such a call and she said you have a very aggressive form of breast cancer and i need to see you immediately and in that moment um my head exploded in fear, very yeah. loud fear. And through the, that cacophony of noise and fear, I heard, be anxious for nothing and grateful for all things. And whether you and your listeners translate that as the universe speaking to me or cosmic energy, whatever, however you want to translate it, I knew it was God speaking to me. Mm. And I got very snarky with God at the moment. And I just had to remind God that I just gotten diagnosed with a potentially fatal tumor in my breast. So this be anxious for nothing thing and grateful for all things, that's not really sitting well with me. And I heard it a second time, Deborah, very, yeah. very clearly. And I knew it was a commandment, but I did not know how I was supposed to obey the commandment because I was scared out of my mind. And yeah. I went to my doctor a few days later and she said to me, had you gotten diagnosed 10 years ago? We had nothing for you. We would have, mm. I would have had to say, I'm sorry, go get your affairs in order. But because you're diagnosed in 2014, if you choose to get chemotherapy for a year, and if you choose to get surgery, I know it's going to work. And in that moment, I understood how I was supposed to obey the commandment that mm. anxious for nothing through gratitude. I, mm -hmm. got, I got to get chemotherapy. I didn't have to get, she was giving me a choice. I didn't have to get chemotherapy. 
I got to get chemo because I lived at a time that had the chemo. And I lived in a country that had the chemo. And I had a job that was going to help me pay for the, the chemo. I was so excited to get chemotherapy. I called it going to my chemo spa because a spa you did. Says you go to get better. And switching that one word have to to get to not only switched my entire experience with chemo, with cancer, but it has really experienced changed my entire life. Every moment of my waking being that I have a crappy attitude, I take a pause and I go, you don't have to be doing this. You get to do this. And a lot of it, and this is what I shared with my student athletes daily, a lot of our get to's is because we live in a country that allows us the freedom that we have as women here. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. But hence, you know, the title of your book, Life is Short, Don't Wait to Dance. Obviously, um, breast cancer diagnosis and, and beating it, fighting it and beating it, um, obviously had a lot to do with that title. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and it's, you know, when you get hit with something like that, I knew, I knew deep down I wasn't going to die from my breast cancer. But you go, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean I'm guaranteed tomorrow. I could get hit by yeah. a bus. I could get a heart attack. I could get, like, why am I wasting one day? And that's kind of what I go back to, Deborah, when I am when I am falling into this cycle that so many of us do, a fear of other people's opinions, FOPO. Um, and, it's, and it paralyzes us. It's like, so many of the things that I want to do, I think, oh, what are people going to say? What are gonna... And it's like, you may, you're not guaranteed tomorrow, Valerie. Get over yourself. Yeah. And live life. Yeah. In your book, uh, we're going back to Coach Wooden now. Um, we're talking a little bit about regrets, right? Here on page five, Coach Wooden lived an impeccable life. And yet in his later years, whenever he was asked if he had any regrets, he would always say, quote, my wife, Nellie, loved to dance. And yet I never danced with her because I was shy and did not think I was a good dancer. Woohoo! That wasn't a lesson for me. How many times do we not do something to this very day? I have my own little secrets of things I won't do because I think I'm not good enough. And I picked that up and I said, come on, just like my t-shirt says, right? What would coach wouldn't do? I have one of those shirts. Um, in fact, I've worn it so much. It's got little holes in it, but what a great lesson right there, right? Regrets on life being too short. So go for the dance. That must have really inspired you, right? It inspired me because um, this was this was in his late nineties. This like this was every time I was with him at a football game, at a basketball game, at a gymnastics meet, at to dinner. People would ask him, "You've lived this impeccable life. What are, do you do? You?" They would be shocked that he had any regrets because he was like Saint yeah. John. And, yeah, exactly. And his regret had nothing to do with winning with his profession it had everything to do with the fact that the one person he loved more than anybody else on the planet earth his wife loved to dance and the coach wouldn't didn't not dance because he couldn't he didn't dance because he was worried about what other people would think and he said that is my biggest regret in life is i did not dance with my wife mm. And it's like, wow. it was such, I mean, it just hits you on so many levels. And it's like, we were just saying, Deborah, it's, if I'm going to die tomorrow, like literally, if I know the day I'm going to die, you know, what is it that I want to do that I'm not doing because I'm allowing other people's opinions of me. And most of those people, we got to admit, because you're out there, they don't even know you. Yeah, yeah. And we're paralyzed by them. Mm -hmm. It's such a silly way to live. And we all talk about it, but yeah. we're all, we're all a victim of it. Hmm. Do you impart that? Um, or did you impart that with your students about strength? Uh, I know that you talked a lot about discipline and about wellness with them. Talk to me about how you reach them through all the different disciplines that helped you get to where you were as a coach, because, because of the way you reach them, look at the success you had with your team as, as winning. And it's not necessarily because the students had perhaps more talent than the ones you worked with earlier. It was, I believe your approach and how you did that, right? How did you, 
I mean, how did they respond to how you were reaching them? Do you know what I mean? I absolutely believe, I don't believe it, I know it, that it started with, and going back to the start of our conversation about the discipline, and Mm. we having discipline with our intentions. Every day, we would start training about 745. And every day, we would line the team up. And all of us, coaches, staff, team managers, everybody would start the day with the discipline, with the intention of making sure that we're starting our day with the proper intention. Close your eyes, a few deep breaths, and then taking a moment to think of something that you're grateful for that you have not earned. So Hmm. I, I did not earn a strong body to get out of bed by myself. I did not earn a strong mind to be able to think the way I am. I did not earn, and you could go on and on and on and on and on. And then they would open their eyes and I'd say, okay, now let's all give thanks to those people that have paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom as women to be educated because we're at UCLA and as women to play sports. Oh, mind you in leotards, okay? Very scantily clad. So let's just take a moment and getting, I can't stress this enough, Deborah. the discipline of setting our intention made every single thing that we did during that next three hours of training have more meaning and it was more grounded and they came about their their workouts with more intention hmm. of gratitude. And I believe that gratitude is the great elixir in life. You speak quite a bit about different students throughout the book. Uh, one in particular you talked about who came to you and she just didn't want to really do it anymore. Um, could you talk to me about her? And then she was not on the team any longer. And then how she found her way back. Could you tell our audience about her? Oh, oh, because there's quite a few that were like that. Okay, yeah, I know. I know, I know. Yeah, Jeanette Antolin. um, She was a great athlete. She missed the Olympic team by one spot in 2000. But she came in and one day she was on the mat on her back. I'm like, Jeanette, what are you doing? And she said, Miss Val, I don't want anybody to ever tell me what to do ever again. I know I read that. I thought, whoa, that's brave, but go ahead. I was like, okay, honey, well, you need to go live on a little island because that's not how life works, (laughs) whatever. And then she just didn't, I mean, she didn't do anything that she needed to do to stay on the team, including academically. So I call her in my office and I'm like, okay, you know, but Deborah, I've never had children. And so I have tremendous, tremendous respect for parents. And this is as close as I've ever gotten to parenting and my coaching. But I remember her sitting on the couch. Actually, it's Coach Wooden's couch um, in my office. And I remember thinking without any doubt that this is absolutely the right thing to help her change her life and make better choices in her life. So she was no longer on the team and she lost her scholarship. Wow. So she's sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. She comes, finds me in the gym a little bit later, grabs my arm, sobbing, I'll change. I'm like, no, 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 trust me. This is going to be great. And her her mom called me. Yeah, I heard that. I'm like, boy, imagine being her parents. I'd be calling too. I'd be like, what? But go ahead, finish the story. It's a great story. Go ahead. But the great part is not what I did, but what her mom did and her dad. Mm. And her mom said to her, and I asked her this maybe two or three years ago. I said, what was it, Jeanette? Because she literally changed her life around. Like she's extremely successful, amazing human, uh, amazing mom. And she said, I give it all the credit to my parents. They didn't bail me out. And they mm-hmm. listened to me complain about you, Miss Val, and how horrible you were. You know, I'm such a bitch to her. And she said, my mom listened. And then my mom said, now let's talk about what you did. What's your accountability to get that brought you to this place? Because that's not all this about. So what did you do? And Jeanette said, my mom didn't let me be a victim. Hmm. And my mom said, as long as you stay in school, we'll pay for your schooling. And that's it. She had a full scholarship. Jeanette got two jobs. 
she became a personal trainer. She'd work at 5.30 in the morning. Then she'd go to school. And then she had another job. Then she would go in the gym at night because she just found, she found her love for gymnastics again. She'd go in to recreation and start playing around with the recreation athletes. And one of her teammates came to me and I said, I think you, they said, I think you need to let Jeanette back on the team. I was like, no. And they said, trust me, she's changed her life. And I was like, we'll see. And so hmm. I went to open rec gym and I just observed her and I saw a different person. I saw someone that was appreciative. I saw somebody that was helping out her other friends there that were working out. I saw somebody that just had, she came from a totally different place versus hmm. a like, and going back to what we're talking about, she came from a place of, oh my gosh, I get to be here and do this versus I have to be here and do this. And that's mm -hmm. what she was like when she was on our team. I have to be here. I have to do gymnastics because I have to earn my scholarship when I have. No, you don't. No, you don't. So she ends up making her way back on the team and was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And without a scholarship. And I don't think I, I don't know if I put this part in the book. There was one of our athletes that was a freshman that um, got very, very, very out of shape to the point that she couldn't do her gymnastics anymore. Wow. And Jeanette, being a personal trainer, having learned that skill, offered to train her over the summer so Ooh. that, because Jeanette knew that this girl had till August 15th to get in shape. Otherwise, she wasn't going to have her scholarship for the next year. And I said, Jeanette, this is amazing because if she doesn't get her scholarship, if she doesn't get in shape, she gets the scholarship, you get your scholarship back. And Jeanette goes, it's more important that I help her learn what I learned. Wow. Isn't that great? Isn't that a great story? It's a great story, but that's also a leader. It's leadership thinking. Yeah. When you're thinking of others, because, you know, throughout the book, you talk about different types of personalities. And I believe you called yourself a helper. Is that what it was? Um, you know, we all I, I looked I looked at that. I'm like, well, which one would I be? Oh, I'm a combination. Oh, OK. It's OK to be a combination. But um, you are you're a helper, but you're a tough helper. And I think what happens is these these women learned the type of person and coach you were and how much they would get out of you. Gosh, where did that come from would you say it was from your parents your upbringing is it the inner valerie um is it everything you know i think it was my upbringing probably and i think it's just who i am uh i mean trust me deborah i think you can maybe able to relate this my mouth has got me in trouble quite a bit of, quite a few times but uh, <laughs> um i just i instinctively know instinct not instinct fully, instinctly know that as human beings, we're born with this competitiveness in us. And I mm -hmm. feel it's, it's a real compliment when someone illuminates something bigger than I'm already doing, mm -hmm. challenges me to achieve that and helps me achieve it. And that's what I felt a coach is. You don't need a, co the only reason you need a coach in your life is to help you do something you can't do on your own. And so, well, the first thing I need to do is help these young women see if they're seeing themselves at this level, what's, what does that level look like? And how much fun yeah. is that? Let's go achieve that. And I'm going to help you do it. Let's figure it out. And that to me was one of the biggest compliments I could get them. Mm. And so kicking Jeanette off of the team and looking her in the eye and saying, this is going to be the best year of your life mm. was the biggest compliment I could give her in that moment even though she hated every cell of my body. Let's talk a little bit about uh, all the world's eyes on you. I remember watching you on TV. I love women's gymnastics. I loved watching UCLA. Honestly, it's right up the street from me. I've attended and watched in person, uh, not just gymnastics, but um, of course, baseball, because I'm a baseball player for a son and basketball. And I loved watching you. And on TV, you just had it, you have it all together. What was it like? knowing that the entire world was watching you, Valerie. And, you know, was it fun? Was it something you didn't think about? Tell me. It was a lot of fun because there's that side of me that loves to be on stage. So I yeah. don't worry about being in a spotlight. <clears throat> I think that's one reason why 
I do have a lucrative speaking profession now mm-hmm. because I don't care if I, if I make mistakes, I've learned it only endears people to me. I don't care about that. What I got caught up in was social media. And I would read because as many people that love you, as many haters, like the more celebrity you get, the more haters you get. And I got caught up in that and I would read all that stuff. And as much as I knew this was coming from people who didn't not know me at all, Mm. it's hurtful. It's very, very hurtful. And again, it takes discipline to either do away with it. It takes discipline to not read it. That's what I worry about. I mean, I have cut, you and I were, had the lovely opportunity to be there at an event at UCLA with Oprah Winfrey and the Surgeon General talking about loneliness being the pandemic in our country right now. And the effect of social media, especially on on our youth. It is a drug and I got caught up in it. I did. And I had to sit myself down and say, this is not healthy. Because what happened was I felt myself starting to coach by what I was reading people were saying about me. Mm. Why did she compete so-and-so? She should have competed so-and-so. Why do I, I'm like, oh God, I should be doing that. And I started coaching based on what these people that don't even know anything about our program, they're not in the gym every day, what they're saying. And I was like, this is not good. And so I thankfully had the discipline to get rid of it. And I did what I was coaching. I had somebody do my social media, but I, since I've retired, do you know that there's a whole world out there of people that aren't on social media? You know what I find, cause I interview authors quite a bit. I love interviewing authors. I, I always say to my kids, if you walk into a bookstore, you're never alone because there's so many people with so many thoughts and you could talk to the, the books, you know, you could, you know what I mean? And um, I often notice that most of these authors don't have a big presence, right, on social media because it's what they have to say that's more impactful for them and who they reach. Um, and the way they reach people is through the w- written word and not necessarily by exploding on social media. I'm with you. I really am with you. I've kind of gotten tired of it. I actually think a lot of people are going in that direction. You talked about the Surgeon General uh, just today or the other day. He was saying that, you know, a warning label, if you will, for kids under 13, don't do it. Um, I, if I did anything right, for whatever reason, my kids were not really on. They, don't, they had a flip phone just to call home for an emergency, right? right? They weren't on that stuff. Um, it does make people anxious and it makes adults anxious. You were an adult when it happened to you. And finally you got it and just ditched it. Bravo to you, Valerie. Okay. So I love following. I do pick and choose who I get to follow. And, um, because life is choice, choices we make to affect the life we live, right? But Denzel, I mean, this has popped up a few times, but when he said, just because you don't share it on social media, it doesn't mean you're not up to big things. Live it, stay low key. Privacy is everything. I remember when Friends first came out and Mm. everybody's watching Friends, right? I mean, that was the thing you did to be cool. You watch Friends, plus it was fabulous. And I remember somebody my age saying, no, I don't watch Friends. I'm like, what do you mean you don't watch Friends? And she said, I'm more interested in living my own life than watching somebody else live a pretend life. That was me. I didn't watch Friends either. I don't think I ever watched it once or even Ally McBeal. That's such a great show. And I know some of the people who are on that show now. And I think to myself, I wouldn't even watch it first round. I watched it. I was too busy um, working. Living. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but you take that premise now, but you take it away from TV and you put it on social media. And it's like, we're, so many people are just, but you know what I found? Because I ask when I do speaking, one question I love to ask the audience is how many of you find yourself scrolling simply to numb out from the day that is, our days are doing this to us. We're so stressed out that we have to numb out. So let's numb out by doing this. But let's think about this. You're stressed out because there's so much going on up here. And the, the goal is to free some of that brain space to be mm. able to breathe it's, and to allow your creative brain to kick in creative brain can't kick in if you're filling it with stuff constantly by scrolling are you allowing that space in your brain no you're just filling it up with more stuff so it makes no sense it's a vicious circle 
You know, I used to say to my kids, go for a walk, drink some water and eat a banana. I don't even know why I said that. Why the banana? But I figured out it's got potassium. It won't hurt them. So I used to do stuff like that. I'd find all little creative ways to get them to do something. You know, one or two of my kids don't love reading books. So I left that off the table. You know, one or two of them also aren't athletes. But okay, you go for a walk. It's something, as you said, for your brain, right? Um, Very, very important. And I do want to give a shout out to the wisdom of wellness. Uh, That's what you were referring to, that our friends did put that on at UCLA. It was magnificent. The Surgeon General and of course was one of the uh, guests hosted, of course, by Oprah. A wonderful day. People look it up. And I know that they're dear friends of yours as well, Valerie. So I'm glad that you gave a shout out to that. Uh, let's talk about uh, your speaking engagements and some of your coaching. You do coach um, some very high profile clients. If you want to you know, tell our audience who that might be or one or two of them, because I know they would know who they are and they'd love to hear about it. Well, I started just coaching by happenstance, and it's really fun. I coached an MLB player who kept going from the minors to the majors, the minors to the majors, and that was really fun to help him reframe that. But I think the yeah. person you're, you're, you're talking about is Alex Rodriguez, um, A-Rod. Uh, I never knew him when he was A-Rod. I've met him just a few years ago, Alex Rodriguez. And I'm not coaching him, but I'm working with his staff and – um, helping him out with a few things. He calls me his no bullshit meter, which I take as a tremendous compliment. Um, yeah. and it's really helping him. I mean, this guy's a freaking billionaire, you know, but it's helping him be able to see the beauty in the pause during your day, Alex, because he gets going so much like his, I always ask him, what's your kryptonite? Okay. Mm-hmm. I know your superpowers. But what's your crypto? What gets in that way? And for him, it is living this life up here as a celebrity, as a businessman, as a da, 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 da. and being able in in this life to honor the pause mm-hmm. and the breath and to see where you're at. And what I see him doing that, I mean, every time I talk to you, you're talking about your sons. It's a huge part of who you are. And what I see in Alex is his daughters are everything. That is his pause. He will, he is able to put everything out of mind, out of sight when he's with his daughters. And I've told him, I've said, you know, a lot of people don't know this side of you and they, especially the haters, you know, and it's really an, it's a beautiful side of him. He has, an amazing relationship with his ex-wife they are co-parenting as well as anybody i've ever met i'm like alex you and cynthia need to write a book um but to be able to to have someone at that level be able to still say okay he calls me coach val okay coach val what'd you see you know he wants me in his meetings when i'm there what'd you see what'd you you know and he's extremely coachable um and it's very rewarding Well, he's got great perspective. Look, he's born with this great talent, right? But he's had tremendous highs, tremendous lows in the public eye for his relationships, right? He is a dad, but it seems like he's got real perspective that he's got more work to do. And to me, um, like I presented this book uh, to my kids. I, you know why I bring them up a lot to you? I wish I had this book when I was raising them, when they were younger. I really do. So I'm telling all parents, whether you have girls or boys, does not matter to all husbands, read this book because the perspective in it and the lessons learned um, are very powerful. It spoke to me. It's also spoken to two of my sons who've already read it. Um, I have a couple of copies. Your people mailed me a few of them. So I'm leaving them around the house. It's like one's in the den, one's upstairs. So I think that's why, because lessons learned by you that you're imparting to us Hello, who's ever in the room? Um, I just think it's very, very valuable. And the fact that now, your book. Oh, my book. (laughs) No, 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 no. Your book. It's I I have it throughout the house. I'm saying that's why I bring the bring my sons up because I wish this book was around when they were much younger, so that they there's so much to learn in this book is what I meant. Um, And I think it's really tremendous. Um, there's a lot more we could be talking about, but is there anything you want to bring up? I don't even know if we have time, but you also go into it with the book. Maybe people can pick it up so I don't give too much away. Um, you know, with Larry Nasser, who was the uh, UCLA gymnastic national team doctor and what some, uh, what 
you know, some of them who literally showed up in your office and told you that they were victims. That is something we could hit upon it now, or we could just, you know, say to our audience, please pick it up. Uh, because that was, yeah. Well, yeah. Larry Asser was the USA, not UCLA, USA national team. Oh, thank you. Thank you, please. Yeah. But <clears throat> the reason why that story is in my book, um, I did have a few NASA victims on, on my team, but one of my student athletes came to me, Kyla Ross one day and Kyla was an Olympic champion and a world champion. And, um, but she also didn't talk very much. So she came in my office mm. and just sat on the couch, started talking to me. And I thought, all right, Kyla, I'll talk to you. And she's talking like her friends and her family and school and graduate school and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, and the important part of that story is we all have this quiet voice inside of us that if, like I'm trying to teach Alex, if we pause long enough, you got to be able to pause and quiet yourself to hear the voice and to listen to what it's saying. And this voice inside of me was saying, don't interrupt her. Don't talk. Just let her get to what she wants to get to because something is going on in her. And yeah. After two hours of her talking, she took a deep breath, looked in the eye and said, I want to tell Ooh. you something I haven't told anybody because I just realized it last night, but I was sexually abused by Larry Nassar. And I said, okay. And she says, but I'm not a victim. I refuse to live my life as a victim. And I said, okay, because I didn't want her sweeping this under the rug. And right, I right. said, you agree that you were victimized? And she thought about it and she went, yeah. I was like, okay, what do you want to do about it? And so we talked mm. this through. We ended up having some team meetings with our sports psychologist there. A few other girls came out. This was smack dab in the middle of our competition season. Ooh. So my job as a head coach is to alleviate distraction, not invite distraction. I was like, Phew, just like setting the whole season and co competing setting that aside because this was more important these are human beings and we won the national championship two months later and as right. after all the hoopla and everything i'm pulling out my bag to go to walk to the bus and i look up and there's kyla and she looks to me and she said miss val i want you to know one of the reasons why we were able to win this championship was because you chose to address the elephant in the room and in doing so, you gave us words to attach to our emotions, to be able to make sense of what we were feeling. And then she said, I literally felt myself walk taller simply because I had been heard. Mm. And that was like, that is Ooh. a lesson that I will take with me to the day I die that I preach to everyone whom I'm blessed enough to speak with is the gift of truly listening to someone is a gift that is absolutely priceless and so we we hear so much about people wanting to be heard they want to be seen but in order to do that you got to quiet your mind so deborah if you write the word listen out and you rearrange those letters it spells silent if you play oh. wordle with the word listen it spells silent and i love that visual because in order to truly listen to someone we have to practice the skill of quieting our minds and listening with all of our senses and we've mm. all been in a situation where somebody has given us that gift it is priceless mm. beautiful please tell our audience um how they can get in touch with you um how they can pick up the book obviously amazon and uh, one quick final question. You can just give me one word. Your favorite sport that you like to engage in. That's why she's in pink, people. My why you're wearing pink. Sport. My favorite sport? Well, whatever you'd like to engage in, in terms of, you know, fitness oh. and sports. Pilates. I love, it's not a, I, it is my, part of my no, zen. It's not a, it is what I started the day after I was diagnosed with cancer. My doctor said, I don't care what you do. You go find something per resistant training. And I was like, I live in LA. 
I'm around all these hot bodies and people that run and do all those aerobics, which I hate. I was like, okay, I gotta find something. So I found Pilates and it's yoga, it's breathing, it brings, it centers me. Um, so yeah, and where people can find me, I am not on social. Maybe someday I may jump back on, but I have a website that is up to date, official, official um, But if you DM me, I check my DMs. And I actually get back to people on DM. So on, on Insta, you do it on, on Instagram? Insta. Yeah, I yeah. just don't okay. post. Yeah. yeah, but I just brought that up about, you're right, Pilates is not a sport. To me, in a way, it's a sport because it's like an active thing, but you're right, it's not an official sport. Because as soon as you sat down, you were in pink and I thought, gosh, she looks so lovely. She matches her book. And you said, geez, Deborah, I just came back from Pilates. Do I look okay? And I'm thinking, yeah, you look every bit the coach and then some. So I'm so glad that you showed up for this interview. I'm so glad that you just did your Pilates and were ready for us. And it was just really delightful to talk to you, uh, Valerie. Please pick up the book, Life is Short, Don't Wait to Dance, a terrific read. It's for anyone. Um, I implore you, if you have kids, let them read it read it yourself um book club if you do any book clubs um that'd be really fun to have you speak at one of those yeah. but i know you're also very busy with your um with your work love as well i love giving back and if i can say yes i say yes to everything i speak yeah. at a lot of clubs um i love it i mean at, at some point in our age i'm i am so blessed to be able to have been retired so many yeah. of us worry about that you know so yeah just make that you know what? Make the ask, right? And make the ask. DM her. Okay, people. So again, life is short. Don't wait to dance. Valerie Condos Field. And you can Thank find you. our interview um, on all audio platforms. You'll find us on iHeartRadio. You'll find us um, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, wherever you get your audio podcast, but we're also a video podcast. You'll find us on YouTube, on Facebook, Instagram, uh, just about any place else where you see your uh, video podcast. Just put in Deborah Cobalt Live, Valerie Condos Field, and you'll find this interview. Please pass it along with your friends. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Valerie, for giving us this time and extra time, too. I appreciate it. Um, everybody have a wonderful day.